caveat, or one thing was uh, we discussed then was the parking, and just uh, Brian handed around a uh, more detailed parking thing, so you can analyze that at your at your leisure. Um, I've got another of the uh, conflict of interest. So we now have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight. Still left off the plate. When, when do you start naming names, Alan? <laughs> can we get the link again? Seven, I'm sorry. How about, well, soon. Okay, is there any, uh, any corrections in the minutes? Any comments, Bill? No, it's fine. Um, just a correction of my name. It's spelled under um, Susser's finance committee. It's K E L L A R. I, I'm sorry about that. No, no worries. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. It's the old expression. I hear what they say as long as they spell my name right. Okay, anybody else? Okay, do I have a motion? So moved. Second? Second. Okay. Motion's made and seconded. Any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, minutes are accepted. Okay, well, everybody bring out your Arlington Public Schools book. Whoopee. And uh, uh, Dr. Bodie and Bill and Diane, you want to come up here? I got three. I could even give you four seats if you'd like. I'm sorry. Okay. We were expecting a big crowd, so we put out a lot of seats, but I guess we're must be a game going on. Uh, Okay, did you shut off there? Okay, if you could. Okay, um, we're having a hearing on the Arlington Public Schools budget book, which we've had for several weeks now. We appreciate you getting that to us so soon, uh, so we'd have a chance to go through it. Um, and I'll just turn the mic over to uh, Dr. Bode. Well, it's nice to see everyone again. It's, it doesn't seem like it's been a whole year, but it, but it has. Um, this evening, um, we're going to give you an overview of our budget. I know that you have the, the books, and I, I imagine that you have a list of questions you want to ask us. Um, but before we begin, I just want to introduce, I think you met La Laura Chesson last week, um, who is the Assistant Superintendent, and of course, you know Bill, Chair of the School Committee, and, and Diane, you know as well. Um, so. Uh, for the most part, um, I'm going to give the presentation, and um, Laura Chesson is going to talk a little bit about technology. I know she's talked to the Capital Committee over the, the past year about the, um, about the allocation for technology for the schools. And uh, Diane will be here for any questions as well as Bill. You have um, our, our PowerPoint tonight. and. Uh, just sort of a quick overview of the different things that we're going to be talking about. Um, basically, some of this you already know, <coughs> and you've seen some of these slides before, which is identification of the process, the timeline, the people who are involved in the development of the budget. I want to talk a little bit about the FY15 year to date and 9C cuts that we've had this year. Um, major points around the F, uh, FY16 budget and also our technology plan, intervention, special education, and the maintenance consolidation <coughs> plan, which I know that you're aware of. So you have a slide on the Arling members of the Arlington School Committee, um, the budget development and timeline. And I think one of the things that we did last year, which uh, <coughs> seems to be working pretty well, is giving you the budget book that we give the school committee and then give you <coughs> any updates and changes that happen through the, the budget discussions that we have. We have a slide here on the um, APS budget development. This, our budget comes from a lot of discussion among curriculum leaders, principals, 
and they in turn have discussions um, with their department or school in terms of what are what are some of the important things that uh, we need to be able to um, continue in our budget as well as additions that we need to consider for the following year and then of course it goes through the school committee and the budget budget subcommittee of the school committee and through the process until we are here tonight and at town meeting in another month or so so for those of you um, uh, who aren't familiar with all of the principals and cabinet of the of the school department you have a couple slides which give names um, two people that are new this year um, our principals at both Dallin Thad Digman and at Thompson Karen Donato but otherwise it's the same principles as, as last year so let me talk a little bit right now about the FY 15 um, year-to-date results as you as, as certainly members of the capital committee are here know we have um, completed a feasibility study for, for Stratton last year and in that plan developed several options for actually how to, how to phase it and fund it it was the um, the decision of the capital committee which um, the, the school department completely supports and that is to try to uh, contain the project to 14 months so that one we we minimize the disruption but also probably can get a, a better uh, contractor who would not want to be able to bid on something that would go off uh, for many years so the plan right now is to uh, begin the project in June 16 with um, relocating to the um, <coughs> back in, back to the new build the renovated building in the fall of 17 so it's roughly a 14 month project and we can talk more about that if, if people are interested um, later on the as you know last year the high school was not accepted um, into the eligibility period for MSBA we have rewritten uh, portions of the SOI including an update of the um, enrollment numbers which we are going to present to the school committee on Thursday evening uh, the Board of Selectmen will have a copy of this and, and certainly will make copies available to, en to any of you as well. Um, this this uh, proposal needs to be submitted to, submitted to the MSBA by April 10th and it goes in through a security portal. In order to submit it we have to have signatures and approval from both the school committee and the Board of Selectmen. <coughs> very much the same process as last year one of the things that um, I know that you're also aware about is our enrollment growth over this last year um, in our projections we thought we would have about 80 new students last year and we actually had more than twice that number of students um, what was challenging last year with this enrollment growth is when it happened for example the kindergarten um, back in March April we were looking at a class a number of registrants in the like, like 420 430 students and our entering class was 502 students a lot of the enrollment growth took place over the summer and so as we were um, experiencing that we were also reacting to the <coughs> types of uh, support teachers classrooms that were going to be needed in order to meet this enrollment growth so we had uh, additional expenditures that went um, above our budgeted number for new teachers um, last summer this year uh, we have experienced um, 9 seat cuts since we've actually put this budget to budget together and also has there been a vote of the school committee on this proposed budget one of them um, the cuts that has affected us not only this year <laughs> but could affect us significantly ne next year is governor Baker's proposal to eliminate the kindergarten grant this grant provides roughly two hundred and um, 
$20,000, dollars of revenue, most of which has gone toward um, salaries. Salaries for our half-time teaching assistants and for one uh, kindergarten teacher. There's been some additional money for professional development, but the proposal is to eliminate it completely. So while it's not reflected in your budgets, um, we've had to look at how we're going to be able to actually fund uh, teaching assistance next year if, in fact, um, the final analysis of the legislature is to eliminate that, eliminate that money. Another cut that we had this year was to Medco in the amount of about $26,000. Our understanding for next year is that the Medco budget will be level funded at the pre-FY15 9C cut level. Um, however, as you know only too well, when you have a level funded budget, in effect, that is a, that is a budget reduction. Currently, um, our special education out of district tuition is running under budget, which is terrific. And as we talked about last year, one of our goals was to be able to put money back into the stabilization account, which last year, as you remember, we had to withdraw in order to cover our special education costs last year. So right now, we're thinking that we might be able to um, put back into that stabiliz stabilization account for special education between two and 300000 And we will have a certainly a number for town meeting because we have right now a warrant article that's sort of a whole, uh, is there for that, for that change. We're, we're pretty sure back in January that we would at least have be able to put some money in. Um, overall, our enrollment has been increasing nearly 3% every year. Um, and over the last three years, this has translated into about 450 students. And we have now over 5,300 students in our district. Um, our enrollment um, will probably continue to grow. We have um, uh, projections that indicate that we're going to have another large kindergarten class coming up. So as I mentioned a few minutes ago, our additional summer hiring um, in order to meet all the needs of our students, class size, uh, reasonable class sizes, and providing specials for the students that um, uh, at the, both the elementary and secondary level required us to actually exceed our number of reserve positions that we had put into the budget. If our enrollment trends continue as projected, um, the Arlington Public Schools will probably reach 6,000 in FY20. One of the things that is daunting about this is how are we going to, as a school system, accommodate these projected numbers? So one, it, it's, a, it's, it's a fairly complex question to answer because at each year we're, we're any, any possible Extra, extra classrooms are being used to um, put in the additional classrooms that we need, particularly kindergarten classrooms. So what we decided to do this year was to uh, solicit the services of an architectural firm to help us do an analysis of space. We, s we sent out uh, bids for quotes. We have those proposals and are very, very close to making a decision on which, which um, firm to, to, to work with on this. The timeline for that space study is from now until um, August. And what we're hoping to find out is if our enrollment continues at this rate, um, first of all, we first want to have a corroboration of whether that's actually the case. So part of the proposal was to have another demographer look at our enrollment growth and just to see if it, if it corresponds to the, the way that we have done it, which is, the, is sort of a best practice in terms of how to do enrollment um, uh, and projecting enrollment growth. But then once we know that, is what is our capacity and at what point are we going to need extra capacity? 
And where are we going to see the greatest enrollment growth? One of the issues we have right now, for example, is at Thompson, we, we now have two classes, two grades that have four classrooms, neither of which can be reduced into three. When the school was built, it was built for three, um, three classrooms at each grade, and then there were, uh, with one exception, and that was kindergarten. So there was 19 classrooms. It is not sustainable at Thompson to have four classrooms at every grade. This last year we had four at Hardy as well. So we have a lot of challenges <coughs> here and we're hoping to get some answers which of course we will, we will share the, uh, the report with you once we have it. But I wanted you to be aware that we are doing this. The next page, this graph, I think is very um, telling as to what we may be, be seeing <coughs> as a challenge. <coughs> what, the, what this graph represents are the, for each year we have entering kindergarten class and what were the number of births at five years prior that entered into kindergarten. So if you take for example 2014-15, you see that in the, the, this particular group, of this particular class, Roughly about 510, um, of 510 births corresponded to this, to this kindergarten. Now, what is sort of unique about this is this is the first time that we had roughly 100% a one-to-one -one correspondence between birth numbers and entering kindergartners. Our entering kindergarten class is 502, and it's actually gone up a little bit since then, but that was the entering. Prior to this, uh, we started at about an 83% uh, rate. So in other words, if, if you had 100, student, uh, 100 children that were born, we would see about 83 of them when they entered kindergarten. May not be the na same students, but I'm just talking about numbers. That 83% started to creep up to 90%, and this year we had 100% in terms of numbers. Now, if you look at next year, 2015-16, you'll see that that number is up to 560. And even if we get 90%, we're going to have a very large kindergarten class next year. How it's distributed in town is something that we don't quite know. I will tell you this, we've just gone through registrations and it's pretty much mimicking what we saw last year um, across the different schools. But I know that also last year we also had a lot of people coming in in April, May, June, July, so I, right now I can't tell you where that distribution is going to end up. But looking out to 1819, um, you, you see a very, very uh, steep rise. And these are children that have already been born in Arlington. When we get to 1920, th then that would, we're, we're in a different, um, we don't have all the data yet because that would have been this year. <coughs> if you look at the next graph, this is uh, again another historical and projected enrollment. And uh, what you can see is that while the, the, the orange is the high school, the, the high school has remained fairly constant and it will for a couple of years. What you're starting to see beginning in um, really in the next couple of years, you're going to start seeing an increase at Audison. And in terms of space for Audison, I think the next two years will be fine, but at, after that we're going to need some additional classroom space. But, but all the enrollment growth, <coughs> the actual increases, are happening at the elementary level. So we have classes at the high school now <coughs> that are in the 300 range, and our entering kindergarten this year was 500. So that, that gives you sort of an idea of the, the magnitude of the change we're seeing in town. So I want to uh, reiterate our, our gratitude that we were able to work with, with you and uh, town manager and the board of selectmen to um, 
to have an enrollment growth factor for the Arlington Public Schools that's based on the previous year's enrollment. And in order to get that growth factor, we all agreed on a 25% uh, per pupil cost for the for the student extension. So this year, there were, I think, 169, <coughs> and that would be that number times the per pupil, the 25% of the per pupil this year. The next slide you can, you've also <coughs> seen before, um, this is, these are the overarching goals, the vision of the Arlington Public Schools. Every year we have um, other goals, other, uh, uh, other projects that we have a particular focus on with the idea that accomplishing those goals leads us closer to the realization, uh, uh, not closer, but what it does is further realize um, the vision of the Arlington Public Schools. So what are our priorities for FY16 going forward? Well, the first is that we successfully conclude negotiations with our teachers and our other unions. Virtually all of our contracts are um, under negotiation this year. We reduce class sizes in specials at Odyssey Middle School. One of the, while we have been able to maintain uh, fairly good core averages despite enrollment growth, um, roughly 23 <coughs> per class. And that doesn't mean that every class is 23. What it means is that we have, we, that's the average, and we do have ranges from the low 20s. And I think we have maybe this year a class of 27 <coughs> and a core class at Odyssey. But what are large are a number of our specials, um, music, art. Some of our art teachers have 30, 31 in the class, our phys ed classes. Every phys ed teacher has at a class of 36 or 37. So we have some pretty large specials. And, and in fact, that also <coughs> has created some scheduling issues. So what we need to do next year is increase those. Um, we also need to add a high school teacher. Um, same, some of the same issues, and that is um, we can, if you can be boxed in in terms of too large of classes if a lot of students select a particular course and either they're going to not get the course or they're going to have class sizes that are very large. So we don't know exactly how that 1.0 will be distributed. It depends upon the registration process that will be going on um, later this month. Um, this year, given our experience last year, we, uh, the school committee agreed um, that was important that we have eight reserve positions going into the summer. It doesn't mean they're just sitting there. We know we're going to use them. In fact, at this point, what our concern <coughs> is that we already have too many of them identified as needs for next year, which I'll talk about in a, in a minute. So one of the ways that we were able to achieve um, creating more reserve positions is to actually look very closely at our legal budget and reduce some of the monies from there. Another way that we were able to identify this, these positions was initially we were going to have an, a half cluster, an additional half cluster at Audison, but we went back and re-looked at all of our numbers and reanalyzed it, and what we've decided to do instead for next year is to have um, a split cluster between sixth and seventh grade. And, e and with that, we'll be able to still maintain our core uh, <coughs> classrooms at around 20, between 22 and 23. Again, there'll be a range when you schedule, but that, that's where the average will fall. Another need for next year, um, and this was probably everybody's highest priority, we had a grant the last three years called Project Success, and in that grant we were able to afford to have a social worker in every one of our, our elementary schools. That grant sunsets this year, and um, unless we were to move two and a half social workers into the operating budget, we would no longer be able to make that commitment of a, a social worker in every elementary school. So that will be funded. We increase, we need to increase one psychologist position uh, to full time next year in order to, um, uh, to meet the, the analysis needs when students are evaluated for special education services. 
Another area that we have been really focused on the last couple of years are our salaries for teaching assistants. <coughs> we, are, we are increasingly not competitive with our neighboring communities. And um, as a result, we're finding it harder every year to find qualified teaching assistants. And this is particularly true um, for s our special education um, classes. So we wanted to increase um, teaching assistant salaries to a higher <coughs> number than 17,000. They had been in the 16,000, si around 16, um, uh, eight. But honestly, being able to meet, meet, meet all of the other needs, it wasn't possible to do that. So it's a modest increase. <coughs> it sounds better telling somebody 17 than it does telling them 16 is the first number when you go to hire them. The other, um, uh, priority was to continue to implement the technology plan and, and Laura Chesson is going to talk a little bit about that in a minute. Uh, we also are going to be contributing to the uh, maintenance department consolidation plan. Next year the school department will uh, contribute 90000 for the salary of the director and, and admin and then the following year the monies that we have for facilities will move into the consolidated department. <coughs> so as I said a minute ago uh, or so, that new information we had since the proposed budget is the fact we're going to lose the kindergarten grant and how that could affect um, our budget for next year. <coughs> how it affects it is that represents about three teaching positions if we were just to maintain what we have. So we, remember we had eight reserve positions, three would now go for that. We already know, uh, having worked with the building principal at, um, at Otteson, that we're probably looking in the neighborhood of, of 1.2 to 1.6 additional um, FTEs for specials there. And another um, development is that the we are going to need to fund an additional three to four ELL positions. Uh, let me talk a little bit about that so you understand uh, what is happening. It's, it's not just happening in Arlington, it's, it's happening in other districts. Just like special education, we go through a coordinated program review with the Department of Education and then they, they point out some things that they think we need to change and we go through a planning process with them. Well, what has emerged over the last two years that we've done this is that what they have always considered recommended amount of minutes for pull out for um, English language learner students is now really not recommended, they're mandating it. We have done, I think, a very good job in Arlington of matching services to achievement. So we look at how our students are doing in, in in all in mathematics and in reading to see how much um, services they <coughs> need. And our students have been doing very well. But the Department of Education has said, honestly, we don't, not that we don't care that your students are doing well, we are very glad your students are doing well, but you still have to meet the number of required minutes for um, students. And so if a student tests what we call a level one or level two in terms of language development, then they must be pulled out of their classroom for two and a half hours every day for special instruction in language. If they're at a level three, four, or five, they need to be pulled out anywhere from an hour to two hours. So we're working on the schedule right now um, in order to be able to accommodate that, but our, our right now our um, projection is about three to four. So as you can see, when you add these all up, we're already now at the point where we don't <coughs> really realistically have reserve positions going into um, next year. So that's where we stand with, with in, in that respect. <coughs> okay, so I messed them all up here. When I talk about the ELL situation, I can. Okay, here we go. All right. 
So here, th this graph here, this one here where we have the um, five-year comparison by budget transfer categories, as you can see this, and you see what the different uh, color coordinates here, you can see that um, there has been an increase over these, um, these last uh, fiscal years from FY12 actuals up to the projected FY16. What I really just want to call your attention to is under administration, and you see the, the purple there for FY16. I don't want you to think that all of a sudden we've got a bloated administration. That's not the case. That's not the case at all, which you'll see in another graph. What that, why that is higher is that all of the money for contract um, settlements has been put into a pool into the administration. When the contracts are settled, then what we're going to do is disperse them to all of the, the salary line items. All right, so here are uh, this graph, uh, the, I said this chart, the summary of the FY16 proposed budget changes. So our net increase in revenue is just under $3 million, $2.9 million. Um, we've had, th but of that, it represented about 2.6 mandatory uh, changes. So in other words, the contractual obligations or, or the natural in, in inflation or uh, cost of running program. So if we were to take a look at the proposed increases that I had gone over, they would total a little over a million dollars. But that <coughs> would exceed what our revenue um, would be. So what we did is we took a look at our budget from this year to see where we could do some restructuring and reductions in order to, to meet the priorities for the FY16. So when we apply the reductions, we, we go into proof with what our revenue is. All right, and so all of the detail of that is in, is in this book, and I'm, I'm sure you'll have some questions about that. You've seen this type of graph before, the circle graph. Again, this in this particular graph, this is based on the current budget um, allotments, but the central administration is higher than it will be once we uh, complete <coughs> contract negotiations. All right, so the revenues, the, the FY revenues uh, will be higher than, as you know, the town appropriation, and it's just a little over 59 million, which is up in total about 5.2% or roughly the the 2.9 million. So it, it's the revenues represent a 3.5% 3. 3 growth in the operating budget, the general general education, a 7% growth in special education. Um, the level fund for the kindergarten fee offset, as you recall, um, when we went to a full day kindergarten without tuition, we had been counting our revenue of $970,000 in our budget, um, and that has remained as a line item. In fact, it's actually been a, a cost benefit to the town because I think that through the Chapter 70 money, we now, uh, the town receives about $1.4, $1.5 million in Chapter 70. And then, of course, the enrollment growth factor, which is based on that 25% uh, per pupil times our enrollment growth. So we have here what the key key drivers are, um, and we we have a town appropriation uh, increase of 2.8 million. We're expecting grants to decline a little bit, but this number now has doubled because of the Governor Baker's proposal. So it'll be probably over 400,000. We'll see a slight in well not slight, but we'll see an increase in fees and reimbursements. Um, to 325,000, and then, as you know, one of the, the where we are at scheduling circuit breaker is that we're always a year <coughs> out. So we know what our circuit breaker for next year will be, which has taken a lot of that guessing out of what to, what to put in as a projection. Now, one of the cautions, though, for FY17 is Governor Baker is suggesting a reduction in the percent for a circuit breaker. And while it won't affect us next year, it certainly could potentially affect us the following year. And so again, uh, the, the graph that just shows the the how 
what the revenue sources are in terms of the whole. And now come to the technology part of sort of our, um, our presentation tonight. And I'm going to ask Laura to talk about this because she has been very much um, the leader in the district in moving this forward, and we're very appreciative of this. Uh, the, the vision of the Arlington Public Schools with respect to technology is that it is a tool to help us move forward with how children should learn and need to learn in the 21st century. It is not just something that we're adding as an augmentation. So Laura, do you want to talk a little bit more about that and then talk about the plan? Sure. Okay. I'm going to um, just actually go briefly over it because you uh, t undertook this for consideration <coughs> last week, a lot, large part of this as part of the capital um, budget presentation. Um, but you'll see the four items there that we really think about when we look at what technology um, should help us, our students be able to know and be able to do. And these four items come almost directly from the Common Core state standards. Um, Massachusetts adopted the Common Core about three years ago. What I think some people are unaware of is that they didn't just take it whole cloth. They added additional um, standards that they felt were important for Massachusetts students that are not part of the Common Core state standards. In addition, there were some minor modifications. So when a state adopts the Common Core state standards, they can take them on whole cloth. Um, the federal um, recommendations, or they can make some minor modifications, and that's what Massachusetts has done. Um, we are lucky that we live in a state that added standards um, as opposed to just taking them away. So the context for our plan and, uh, is that we, you know, we've had a, a number of investments in technology, thank you to the generosity of the town and the capital committee, and we continue to use a pilot evaluate expand model so we don't just go out and spend um, money without first piloting it, uh, a choice that we might make. We do an evaluation of that choice. As a matter of fact, um, this week at the school committee meeting, one of the sixth grade clusters is going to talk about the pilot that they're running and the evaluation that they've done on that. And then we look, um, based on favorable data, whether we should expand that model or not. There's a great need of professional development. Um, many uh, school districts across the country have put millions and millions of dollars into technology, but without the corresponding necessary professional development, you're really throwing good money after bad. Um, so we also feel that we have a strong need for technical support, and we have a, a fairly good technical staff. Um, are they stretched as thin as they possibly can be? Yes, I would agree that they are, but they are able to um, keep the equipment and the software and the networks up to date. Um, and we not only need <coughs> technology as part of instruction, but also in support of instruction. Teachers are being required to do a large amounts of data analysis in order to make decisions, <coughs> much the way Dr. Bodie talked about what we do with ELL students. We really <coughs> look at student success data and student achievement data, and that's how we make decisions about changes in instruction. Finally, the security uh, is paramount in our, both for students utilizing the software, but also for student data, and also with our hardware. And we meet or exceed industry standards in terms of that. Should you ever want to know more about um, the model that we base our, the research that we base our model on, um, there's a website here that you can go and take a look at that talks about the fact that we move from just using technology as a substitution for something that we might have dan done manually, for example, typing something on a typewriter and then going to a word processor, all the way up to redefinition, where we look at what um, a task that a student might do and how that changes with the use of technology. And I'll just take just a couple brief moments to just give you an example. So we have a first grade class at Thompson Elementary School that read a book written by an author. And then those students, then using Book Creator, wrote a similar book of their own, uh, on the style of the author. They then um, read those books aloud to the author via Skype. The author was so impressed by the students that she um, scheduled a visit to the Thompson Elementary School the next time she came to a book signing in Boston. And additionally, the students then recorded their, themselves reading the books using a QR code, which is one of those things that you see when you scan things. And then younger students are able to come to the library and using their iPads, they're able to scan the QR code and read the book that the student has written and listen to the student's voice. So it really has changed 
um, how uh, a task that might have been students just making a book on paper that they might have shared with mom and dad, and now it becomes um, shared with a, a, large, a larger audience. Teachers tell us that when students share those kinds of things with a larger audience, they um, are more motivated to do a better job. Uh, they um, are also um, more motivated to write more um, and are more excited about the process that they do. So that's just an example of one of the many things that we have done with technology. Um, so if you look on the next slide, um, and, and Ms. Johnson uh, did an outstanding job just sort of summarizing these for you last week, uh, week. I just want to uh, talk about a couple of these items. <coughs> um, assistive technology in, is how we're going to um, and continue our efforts to hold special education costs down as much as possible. Um, we use assistive technology for students who are autistic, students who have language disabilities, students who have visual disabilities. Uh, it allows special education students greater access to the general education um, uh, cu curriculum. Unfortunately, at this point, about 90% uh, of our assistive technology is five years old or older. And the changes in technology, as you're aware, are very <coughs> rapid, and we will be able to do a better job meeting the needs of our special education students by upgrading this technology. Um, and additionally, we have spent um, the vast ma majority of our monies over the last um, two years at the elementary school level. Um, and so as a result, the, there's a significant age to our student devices at Odyssey and um, the high school. And uh, we've had a great um, increase in the number of students that are looking to take courses in um, CAD, which is computer-aided design and computer science at the high school. And several years ago, there was no program, and it had kind of gone to the wayside. We've now revitalized that, and next year we will have two classes in AP Computer Science. But in order to have students <coughs> to be able to populate that class, they need to start getting experiences with technology in a, in a very, very deep way at um, an earlier age, so we need to upgrade the technology at Audison. And in addition, if you read the Common Core State Standards, you will find out that it specifically says in, in about 82 places, students will use technology too. So that in order to meet those standards, and we want to continue our, our Arlington students to continue to achieve at a high level as they are across the state, um, compared to the rest of the state, we need to make sure that our students are prepared to do that. As, uh, Dr. Bodhi talked about the uh, growth that we've had, and in Dallin and Brackett, they're so much larger than our other elementary schools <coughs> that the access to technology is currently inequitable, and we need to um, increase the amount of technology in those buildings. And finally, um, Ms. Johnson told you last week that we made, thanks to the MSBA, a considerable um, investment in technology at Thompson, and we need to start to begin to replace that um, on a replacement cycle that will be uh, a four-year process. All right. Um, and then I'm going to sort of wrap up a presentation talking a little bit about special education. <coughs> First of all, I want to define special education because sometimes you think of, I think there's a perception that any that any of our intervention programs really qualify as being special education and they do not. We define it it's just as the state defines it, and that is it includes um, costs that are funded by the uh, special education uh, grants, legal and transportation costs, when directly supporting special education. <coughs> Basically, the, these special education costs are in support of students that have an ed individual education plan. Interventions is a general education program. <coughs> They certainly can support students that have an IEP, <coughs> but they are designed for all students, all students who, who might be struggling um, with, a, with math or reading. For students that have this kind of support, it, it can make a difference for them, not only in their <coughs> own um, learning, but also, I think, in some instances, um, maybe able to prevent students from having to go to the to having an evaluation for special education. When we look at um, our chart here, and you can look at the, uh, the different, the actuals for general education, intervention, special education, uh, what you can see is that uh, we have been able to maintain roughly, uh, even though 
roughly a ratio for general ed to special education costs. That, that has stayed fairly stable even though both have increased. <coughs> um, what you can also see is that for interventions, we have, we're fairly steady, but we have increased in the last couple of years and, and project to increase next year a little bit more in our intervention programs in order to support all of the learners in our, in our school district. And uh, we also are going to be, able, and part of that is, is also uh, funding increased support for our ELL students as well. One of the things to notice, though, is that um, uh, as we're looking at professional development here, it has remained fairly um, stable in a smaller part of our budget than, than what we would like. It, having good professional development is key for the vitality and the strength of any school district. Um, we have infrastructure costs and administration that has um, changed, but again, the, the increase in 16 is related to contracts, uh, not to any major surge there, in fact, no surge at all. <coughs> um, so the special education expenses by funding source, if you look at this, the orange part here is the, is the amount that we receive from town appropriation, which has been increasing over the years. Circuit breaker, while it was low for 11 and 12, um, has increased um, but remained fairly stable and uh, the special education grant is, has not changed at all. In fact, in, it's gone down since 11 to where we, we are today. So looking at that to the town appropriation for special ed compared to um, the actual allocation for special education, one of the things that you will see here in this is that the relationship between uh, the portions of special ed funded by the town and uh, the, uh, the town appropriation for special education <coughs> has sort of a, a, changing, uh, a, a changing relationship over the years. And in some situations, we've had deficits. And in other situations, we've had um, a positive change. In fact, in FY13, there was a positive change, uh, a, a positive delta, and we were able to put some money into a special education stabilization account. Um, we went down again and up again, and um, this year, in where we, we have a positive differential, we expect that at the end of the year, we'll probably have between two and 300,000 that we would put into that stabilization account for the year where we don't have that. And so you get a, a, a sense of what those changes have been over time. Um, and the last thing to say is that, as you, as you know, we're going to have there's the, the, the ongoing maintenance committee that uh, in the town has recommended the restructuring of how we organize all custodial and maintenance for our facilities. As a town, we've invested a lot of money in our buildings, particularly our school buildings, and the one we're sitting in now. And it's important that we give the kind of attention to maintaining these buildings so that they last a long time. And I think that the way it has been organized over the years in, in just different parts of the di different budgets and different um, departments <coughs> has um, competed that a little bit in terms of being able to do long-range planning. So this department will, um, I'm assuming, will approval of, uh, of all the, the, the people necessary in this process, be able to have the consolidated department next year. The uh, school department will support that, and then the following year we will move um, our uh, facilities money into that consolidated budget. So that's our overview, and we're going to be open to any questions. What we need tonight um, is that um, the Arlington School Committee respectfully request that uh, you give approval to the FY16 for the Arlington Public Schools. Okay, well thank you very much for the presentation and uh, I'll open it up to the floor of the Finance Committee with any questions they may have. John? Uh, I'm afraid I didn't understand this graph. Could you 
So the green represents the amount of expenditures from special education that were funded by the town appropriation. So these are the special ed expenses that weren't covered by circuit breaker, that weren't covered by grants. That's the green. In FY12, uh, the town in the long range planning decided to give us uh, a particular amount. So instead of just giving us one appropriation, they broke the appropriation into two pieces, general ed and special ed. <coughs> Recognizing that special ed grows at a much higher rate than general ed. And so in 12, we see that's the first year. And that year, the amount of money that the town allocated for SPED was less than the amount that was spent out of the appropriation. And so that over under I represents it. Thank you. And the reason 16 is so mutated is in large part because we don't have the contract settlements showing up here. So when they come in, they're going to change it. But my hope is, is that while you know you see the 290 to the good in FY15, I hope that we're going to be able to transfer that to stabilization um, at town meeting this spring, and assuming everything stays the way it is. I'm also hoping that at 16 we may be able to transfer again. I mean, you know, if if we're able to hold the line, the problem with special ed is, as we've seen over and over, is that it just doesn't behave itself. It's up, it's down, it's all over the place. And um, by creating a deeper stabilization account, that hopefully we can get to the point where we can budget more tightly without always living in fear for those wild swings that are really devastating to your budget. Thank you. Okay, uh, So on slide number 18, uh, can you talk to you like, uh, we have like 3.5% growth in general education and 7% growth on the special education for the year for 16. And if you, my question is like, uh, do you expect to, like going for the future years, 17, 18, uh, or 19, we expect to have a more growth for the special education because it's almost double compared to general education. Yeah. No, that's part <coughs> of the long range plan. Yeah. Uh, if you remember when, I, so I, I, I'm sure Andrew Flanagan yeah. presented that to you. That's part of the long term planning because as we looked backwards in time at special ed expenditures, year over year it worked out to about seven. 12 some years, three others, but seven was about how it went. Now, could we get to a point as a district where it didn't go at seven anymore? I hope so. I really do. I hope we get to the point where we've created stabilization and our budget is growing at a lower rate. But history has taught us that it tend, that 7% tends to be the right number. Okay. And another question on that topic is, have you compared that to the neighboring communities like in Belmont? It's How very difficult to make those kind of comparisons. Um, I've tried. You know, one of the things that's very different is the percentage of special ed kids in the district. Belmont has many fewer kids on IEPs than does Arlington. Um, Lexington has more, but Lexington's a bigger district. The state defines special ed differently than the way we're defining it here. They don't include grant money at all when they think about it. And they, they narrow it down to a very specific category of town appropriation expenditures, which makes it really hard to get your hands around. I would say that in general, high performing, high expectation communities with parents who don't want anything less than above average children tend to have very high special ed costs. On the other hand, very disadvantaged communities can have very high special education costs as well. Okay, uh, we're around grants. Um, on your uh, projected enrollment, question, how many, uh, uh, how many students, or what's the rate for uh, elementary to go on to the Odyssey? And then let's say from the Odyssey to go on to one-to-one, -to -one, is, is it the same amount of students? There, if you go to our website, there's a... Go ahead. Oh, thing. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> no, actually, Diane's got a first answer, because she actually has done all the enrollment projections. Um, out on our website, there's a, a calculation that we've done, and we use a, a five-year weighted continuity rate. So we look at what's happened in, from kindergarten to first grade over the past five years. The most recent year being five times more important than the most distant year. And we create a rated cost. And so we take the incoming numbers, we multiply it by that rate, and that gives us the projection for the next year. And so we do tend to see a dip between fifth and sixth grade. We also tend to see a dip between eighth grade and ninth grade. People that are gonna peel off to go to private school, those are jumping off points. If they're gonna go middle school privately, 
Um, and also, if they're going to go vocational, they're going to jump off between 8th and ninth grade. But what we see, interestingly enough, is that the numbers tend to rebound in 7th and 8th grade and in 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. That we, we are not, you know, it, it's not a one-way shoot. And like they, they didn't like the schools that they went to and came back? Or new ones move There's in. Seminar. You know, okay. that it's, not, it's not as simple as that. Okay. We seem to be a very attractive community, and we're not all front-loading kindergarten. Even though on this graph, you look at the birth rates of kindergarten, and this kind of scares me, we're definitely got more babies. What we're seeing is that people are moving in. We, you know, we have above 100% retention in like first grade, second grade, third grade. So people are coming with pre-made babies and then having more. Right, yeah, yeah. No, they're moving for the school. Right. right. Yeah. And so, you know, the, the, have children. the growth yes. isn't confined at the bottom end of the spectrum, and then a steady number goes up <coughs> through the chute. It, it, they're coming in at all. All it, it just that the growth isn't one, but the, it seems consistent. That <coughs> happens, so, and, like, where does it go? But, it, wasn't, you know, yes, it wasn't just L, uh, kindergarten last year, it was across the board. Our, re our retention percentages are usually in the 90%. Some of the grades is 100%, um, and then some that are maybe 90 They're very high. Uh, in Kelwin Manor, where I live, uh, and you know, two families moved out my age, no kids. Two families moved in. Five new kids hit Hardy in one year, different grades. I'm familiar with the trend. Okay. Um, <laughs> so it's professionally speaking. Yeah. <laughs> but no, it's no so green bars seem to be you know growing at a greater rate, and that's the elementary, not just one grade. So yes. it, that just seems to say, well, you know, perhaps they did peel off, but but they come back. But uh, but okay, so it's the bigger classes are beginning to age up into the middle school. You know, we have classes of 300 at the high school, roughly speaking. You know, we have classes of mid fours to, to 500 now in kindergarten. And the classes of the Odyssey are, you know, as they're aging up, they're not going away as they age up through elementary. So we're gonna end up with an awful lot of kids bottlenecked at the, at the Odyssey if, if these trends continue. And that's that, what I'm, that's, that doesn't seem to be depicted in here, but that's kind of like, where is, when is that gonna happen? Well, you, know, you're, 20, you can kind of see it, the pink is getting, Fatter, yeah, yeah, wider, so to speak. But it is, uh, uh, but so it's later in the future that we're going to see the effects of the growth. Is, where it is okay. We right, are so starting to see them in Audison. We had a we had a really big cohort of sixth, sixth graders, graders, but we have not as big a cohort of incoming sixth graders. Right. We, we had right we now. have three hundred ninety two sixth graders, and there could have been four hundred and twenty coming from fifth. So it's always a drop off. Um, and next year we're expecting somewhere around 400 as well. But the classes that are coming up behind are in the 460s, 480s, 500s. So that's, that's we're still a couple years away, um, but if, if these students all stay in Arlington, which all of our numbers predict, yes, Addison will grow. And the high school will probably be, um, what do we say, 1600 by FY20, I think that was what we were projecting. And the, for me, the scary one is, is the 18-19 school year. It, it's above 600 um, births. So if, they, if we pull 100% on that, we're going to have a ginormous kindergarten class. I mean, even if we pull 90%, it's going to be a really big class. And, and that's not that many years away. Right. All right, thank you. Okay, Bill. I had a question back on page eight. Um, I think you took this point before the high school was not accepted into the uh, MSBA construction pool, mm -hmm. so we're going to try again this year. Um, any thoughts on why? Uh, well, <coughs> what might be doing differently? Uh, uh, Purples might be how it might be different this time around. Well, a lot of it has to do with which districts put in. Uh, statements of interest. Last year they had a lot of districts put them in. Some for the accelerator, they had something like 229, 30 projects of which roughly half between core and half between accelerated repair. What I did know, I did learn from the director was that last year they had more projects presented that came from um, uh, cities in, in cities in the Commonwealth. What what that means for an Arlington or a suburban is that 
when they, they fund that school, it's at a higher percentage rate. So there's a certain amount of money they have every year, and, and depending on the percentages, that can also affect how much money is available, period. I don't know what our competition will be this year in that respect, um, um, but we certainly will put it back in. I know that we, our project moved along a little bit in the process. We didn't make the final cut or two, but um, we're certainly going to resubmit it. Now, in terms of what we're resubmitting, we're looking at enrollment growth. But another <coughs> issue, we've really taken a look at some of our, um, our uh, some other issues too. One has to do with security, really getting a little bit tighter in our description. Another is our building envelope. Uh, we, we have, um, we're seeing more penetration of water into the high school as the mortar of the building becomes more porous. And I think, in fact, we were even talking about the possibility of having a hydrostatic test done, and where we stand on that. So we've emphasized some more of these um, issues that have become even more apparent as we've gone through this winter. In fact, we were just um, doing finishing touches on it today. Uh, and Ms. Johnson, would you want to say anything more about some of the, the other key issues? We also um, looked at um, uh, ADA. While we had that in our report last year, we brought it more to the center so that people would notice it because one of the issues we have at the high schools is one elevator. <coughs> and mm -hmm. this year it's not been very reliable. And it, for those of you who know the high school, it's over in the Fusco building. Well, if, if you're disabled and you need to use that elevator, whether you have a broken leg or something more serious than that, it's, a, it's, an, it's an ordeal to get from class to class if you have to go the entire length of the building. So emphasizing more of the impact of that one elevator on students. That's a, those are of, the if, if I just might add, one of the other factors in, in selection, if a school all of a sudden, uh, similar to the one in, in Somerville, had a collapsed roof, or out in the western part of the state, a tornado ripped a brand new building apart, that building automatically gets put right at the top and everybody gets pushed down one. There was one in Lexington, my daughter teaches there, within three years from identifying PCB in the foundation, they have a brand new school because of safety is, is the number one thing. So even if you meet all the criteria and you're just about there and a couple of disasters happen, everybody gets pushed down in the thing. Uh, I think from my perspective, the biggest thing that we have is our student growth. We're exploding. And uh, it's the quality of the school. You know, the, the general condition of major systems, you know, we, we need a major overhaul. I just want to emphasize on the NEASC, <coughs> the only negative part of that report was the, the facility. The they gave us high marks on the education and the teachers and everything else. It was the facility that we, we got the negative marks. Okay. Charlie? <coughs> yeah, I have a, a couple of questions, mostly about special education. If I look on page uh, number, your five-year comparison by budget transfer category, okay. it looks to me like the projected uh, fiscal year 15 expenses is up about 3.2% uh, over the prior year, 19.5 over 18.5, or 19.1 over 18.5. But I don't know what page What section, Charlie? What, what page is it after, Charlie? 15. Oh, 15. Oh, sorry. In the, uh, oh, you're the I think I think what's reflective of that is that if you look over three years, you can see that the growth it took a major bump up in 14. And so from 13 to 14 was a huge step, and from 14 to 15 is a small one. And that's very typical of the way special well, education costs. 13 was small. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, that that, that is that but is the that is the bugaboo of sped. But I'm just trying to understand that. So the so the increase was three point um, three point five percent in in uh, fiscal year fifteen over fiscal year fourteen. And what was the percentage from thirteen to fourteen? Um, we well, in other words, you're, you're 4%. We, 
we saw special ed, we, we saw special ed take off in four, out of district tuition take off in 14 and then we we saw it stabilize in 15. That was the that was the major well, swing in the budget. Let me ask a question more explicitly. What did not increase? Did was the outside uh, cost didn't go up, or you control the in the um, in district budget cost? What was where was the source of the the out of district tuition that we saw? We saw our out of district placements go up very heavily in fourteen, and we did not see a comparable increase in fifteen. So it stabilized. We lost so a number of students to out-of-district placement in 14 and did not lose an equal number in 15. We stabilized. And so your in-district costs went up by 7%. I'm sorry? Your in-district costs in fiscal year 15 over 14, they, they went up by 7%. I mean, I'm, I'm, it's, it's, not, it's not obvious there, I'm asking the question. How did they, what, 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 what caused the increase in your fiscal, what caused the three and a half percent increase? Um, contract increases on staff, um, changes to staffing, and any kind of changes to transportation or tuition. I mean, you right. don't see you don't see a steady seven percent growth year over year. No, I'm, I'm just trying to understand what the drivers are. What actually out of district tuition? Did the number of students in the special education program increase? No, it's been did relatively the stable. Did consultants increase? No, that's Hopefully been relatively stable. So what what was the eight <coughs> percent increase? I'd I'd have to go back and look specifically. I can't I can't do that on the fly. I don't know what you're driving at. I really don't. Ex unless you're trying to bust me on the fact that it's not no, 7%. Diane, don't, don't, don't be wise. I'm right? not trying, trying to be wise. The question. I'm, I'm trying, trying to, to understand it. What the, what the driving costs are in special education. Out of district tuition, staffing, transportation. I could come up with that list. I'm asking you what it was. And you, the answer is you don't know. Off the top of my head, I don't. I can't answer that question no, I right now. I appreciate it if you do have it back to the budget. Certainly. Um, Can I ask what, what comment? One thing is that you're right, there are certain drivers that hit special education, and um, one of them that is coming up is going, we hope will not be significant, but we don't know for sure, is the bus contract. We, we um, work with labs to try to keep the cost down, but they're going to be undergoing all contract negotiations with transportation. This year, um, it has remained, it's gone up, but it hasn't gone up precipitously. We don't know what's going to happen next year, so that's one. Another thing that does is a driver in special education costs, which um, I think Dusty has done not such a great job of controlling, is the tuitions that are able to be charged. Um, the, um, um, schools will go into Desi and say, you know, we, we have these capital expenses, we have these increase in costs for personnel, and therefore, um, you know, we want our tuition to go from 55 <coughs> to 65. And I tell one like that, that's just tuition. One advantage we have in trying to control that is, is having uh, have the lab collaborative. But there are some drivers that are out of our control in some respects. Um, the students to present themselves. This year, it's been a year where we haven't um, had a lot of students have had to go to out of district. And that's actually a good thing. I think it's, it's, it's desirable to be able to have students that are going to stay in district and, and be and, and avail themselves of our educational program. So you know, you're absolutely correct is that there are certain drivers that really can push special education. And I don't think any one of those was particularly out of the ordinary. They're just, they increase faster than, certainly general inflation, which hasn't been much, but they increase faster than a lot of other parts of our budget. The point is that there's no information here about the budget that's growing 7% a year. And it's, if it continues to grow 7% a year, it's gonna soon be equal to or greater than our, our general education budget. And and there's no analysis or no understanding of why this is continuing to increase. Let me just, mm -hmm. I have a second part to my mm -hmm. question, which is 
in this same set of numbers here, you're forecasting uh, 19.15 to 19.31 is the growth in the budget um, in fiscal year 15 to fiscal year 16. That's roughly a 1.6% increase. Absent any contract settlements. Thank you. I heard that five times. Good. My question is, are you going to are you going to absorb six percent from the contract increases? Yeah. I hope not. So so what? Where is the seven percent growth? I think very, that we are not going to have a seven percent growth in FY sixteen. I think that's pretty clear because we're going to be putting some money back into the stabilization account. But, but earlier in your budget, one of the assumptions that you made here, <coughs> if I believe I saw this in the earlier part of the presentation, is that the budget was based on a 7% 7, 7 growth in the, um, in the special uh, education budget. It was on one of the earlier slides. No, it's a 7% growth in the town revenues on the town portion that's Nobody dedicated to special money. education. That was it's a part, revenue growth part slide. part of our, our plan for the town, we... we, we Here, yeah, on, on 18. On page 18. So it's up because this seven percent growth in special education. But I'm, I'm, no, that's I'm the, saying I don't the revenue see seven from the long. That's the revenue from the long range plan. You're absolutely right that in a particular year, there's not necessarily. But this number came from our joint looking at what the vagaries of the special education costs were over a ten year or seven year. What we're hoping is that that will decrease. That has been a goal of ours, is to be able to contain special education costs, because you're absolutely right that when those costs get out of, um, out of sync with the expenditures for general ed, you can't hurt your general ed program. We're very aware of that. So, let me go to my, the next question. Mm -hmm. So there was not a 7% growth between 14 and 15. There's not a 7% growth projected between 15 and 16, yet your aggregate budget number is based on a 7% growth. So where is, let's assume that there's a 3% um, increase in the um, in the contracts, so or 2% or 3%, whatever they, whatever it gets to be negotiated. Add that to the 1.5% that you've got in growth from 15 to 16, you're still 2 to 3% shy of 7%. But that 7% number is driving the overall school budget number. Where are you putting that money that you said was going to go into special education? We're hoping to put it into stabilization. We are. And if we in, can't. In fiscal. This 16? year. In this year. I'm asking you about your proposed budget. In 16, the thing, the thing that's always. Wish we had a crystal ball. Because. And I, I, I roll us back, to the, but you have to get us back and connect the dots to what your previous experience has been with this. As we're sitting here in March of 2015, I don't know what is going to appear next year. I don't. What I, all I can tell you is that when we look at this historically, we see that the, the average growth over a decade is going to hit that middle. Let me just remind you of a year not too long ago, which was actually uh, something that's sort of etched in my memory, is the year that in August, we had two students move into the district, each of the cost just shy of four hundred thousand dollars in in special education costs. We had no way of knowing that. Just like we have no way of knowing sitting here today Excuse me, that we Dr. don't. Cody, that's not my question. My question is, you have a budget, mm -hmm. you've worked months on the budget. You, it's based on a number of factors, including seven percent growth in the special education budget. That's correct. You don't show 7% growth in the special education budget. You show at most 3.5% or something like that, including in the contract. In this one year. In this one year. Right. So I'm asking, in fiscal 16, in this one year, what have you done with the difference in that money? We're planning to put it into stabilization. If we don't Where need is it. it? Well, right now, well, it's I, sitting in settlement. I mean, I, I think the... The seven percent number was an average over ten years, so it's a, it's it's it goes into the bottom line. I'm not, I'm not telling you. I'm, I'm asking, in the in the budget that you presented to us here, mm -hmm. you're not showing seven percent growth in the special education budget. 
is going someplace else, the difference, two or three percent of the special education budget. Where is it going? That's my question. It's a very simple settlement. question. It's settlement. settlement. It's sitting in the settlement right now. So it's, it's can can I make a quick okay. Okay. Can I Charlie, I had the same, I, I had the same <coughs> question you had, um, and I was working on it over the weekend. I think what's, what's going on is that actually, when we look at this, I add a third bucket in my hat. I say we have special ed, general ed, and student enrollment growth. What, what, what I think is, what I see what's, what's going on is the general enrollment growth funding is actually one year in arrears. So what looks like what's happening partly is, so the example I would give is the incremental you got for fiscal 15 was based on not 169 kids, it was based on a- 13 oh, to 14. It, it was based on- Two a prior lower, fiscal years. A lower number, right? So they got caught They got caught with this higher number this year and they had sort of scramble and fitting classes and stuff like that. So the amount that's under 7% this year is really going into, it's going back into general ed. And it's partly being used to fund that gap in, in enrollment that they have with the enrollment growth. So, so then, then I, then I think we have a, a problem because this is a misrepresentation of what our our plan is. If we if, if we take this is not the first year that we've taken money out of special education, money that was earmarked, if I can use that term, for special education, and put it into general education. And it's just obvious at the beginning, right? You know, at the start of the year, last time we, we was after you know after the fact, but now it's obvious before the fact that that, that money that you're, you're not growing at seven percent in special education. The money's going into general education. Would you feel better if the budget grew at 7%? I'd feel better if we knew what we were doing. I think we do know exactly what we're doing. I'm trying to be completely transparent here. This is what we really think it's going to look like, but we've been beat before with special ed. Okay, okay I think related to this. What, what's the balance in the stabilization fund that you have set up? Zero. We drained it last year oh, okay. because of the 12% growth. Mm -hmm. uh, when? Yeah. So, so, I mean, yes, in the proposed budget, the money is going into regular ed. In some years, part of the 7% special ed growth goes into regular ed. In other years, like FY14, we end up with a 12% special ed growth. <coughs> the money comes out of regular ed into special ed. So if you look at over the years, there should be a 7% increase on average in special ed and a three and a half or, or lower increase well, it's, it's affected by the enrollment growth factor, so it's not even going to be three and a half percent, but it's going to be more than that. But we, you know, Diane has given you the ten-year average in special ed costs that shows the trend being seven percent. And so the budget is is the funding is based on that ten-year average. The actual spending plan looks at each year, <coughs> and this year they're thinking it's not going to go up seven percent; it's only going to go up. 4%. So we, we get this extra 3%, we're going to spend it in other areas where we have need. But next year, it may end up being the opposite. It's going to be a 10% growth in special ed. So our regular ed is going to have to grow 4% and they'll absorb that. That's the agreement that they've had with, with the Long Range Planning Committee and that's how it's worked. It might not be, it might not be the best way to go. I'm not, I'm not saying we can <coughs> discuss that, but I think, you know, arguing you know, right tonight is probably not the best, best way, but that was sort of the understanding, was that some years, yes, regular ed's gonna be funded more than three and a half percent. Some years, special ed's gonna be funded more than 7%, because it's all based on average. I think that uh, if, if you, Diane, could, could get uh, some of the uh, drivers, say for this three and a half percent. If you increase. go in section um, 10, and if, in your budget book, it has all the detail of everything that's been spent from 12 through 14 in actuals, and then this year's project, 15's projections in the 16 budget. Yeah. So you the data would, is all there. You know what would be helpful there, actually, I don't know if it would actually be possible, because I, I actually end up having to do it on this random separate sheet here. If there's any way to consolidate that under the object descriptions, I, you know, obviously, from a, from a management perspective, when you talk about like Stratton and Dolan and you go around to all the school doing it's great, right? But from our perspective, we're just sort of adding up all those buckets under the object descriptions to make it mm -hmm. similar. Yeah. Thank you. Well, actually, if you look, one of the ways that the, that, that aggregate almost exists for you is the program summaries. Because the program summaries are what I use to distinguish special ed costs from general ed costs. 
So if you look at program summaries um, 68,000, which is pre-K special ed, through 6866. Tab 6. I'm sorry. Tab 6. Sorry. I know it too well. Yeah. It's um, it's program code 68, 6800 through 6866. It's actually on page two of three in section six. Which section? Section, section six. six. And then there's more. But wait, there's more. Um, it would be also um, 6975 <coughs> and 6980. And <coughs> six nine nine zero. Okay. So there's three transportation codes that are also in special education. Yeah. So that would be your aggregate. So that's where you'll see it, and it's broken out like that rather than by cost center. Um, <coughs> it tells you, you know, how much we're spending on OT, how much we're spending on behavioral support. <coughs> I mean, one of the things that we saw a real uptick in for medical expenses um, was for hearing and visual services which show up under medical expenses. <coughs> and this is the best place to see the out of district costs as well. It's under 6848 for day out of district tuition and 6851 for residential out of district tuition. It runs just under just over 100 typically. It fluctuates. I'd just okay. like to emphasize that's not a number you can divide into a, a cost right. you, you, because some may be very high, some may be very, they vary. Okay, th is this on the special ed dean or? No, I just have okay. my own questions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, two questions. Uh, you're getting a cut from under METCO. Uh, who gets the, sub the chapter 70 money from METCO? It comes into the general fund. To the Allen fund. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, go back to the English language nurse. Mm -hmm. A child is pulled out of the regular class for two and a half hours? Correct. That's half the day that the school gets I know. There. I know. And they won't even uh, allow us to do a push in model where we would have the the ELL teacher come into the classroom and support them in the classroom. Yeah. How long does that child stay in that program? Until it tests to uh, what they call level three. There's five levels of language acquisition. What's that average first, second, third? It could take a, a year, two years. I don't know if anybody's gone three. Right. In Arlington, we generally don't have students that go three, yeah. but there are students that are not making progress. They're, we look at their growth. Uh -huh. There's actually an assessment that gr looks at from year to year what their growth is. And if their growth is not over half, a, point 0.5 is considered an average growth. Um, if with it, what we were doing is if they were below that, we were providing them with more services. If they were at that, we continued at the service level they were at. If they were ex exceeding that for a large, a large extent, we would cut back on the services. Um, unfortunately, uh, the state is no longer allowing us to make that decision. Okay, Dean. All right, sorry, I got caught off guard. But thank you for coming in. I appreciate it. Thank you for the books. I do like consistency, except I don't know how I feel about the new tabs that you added. <laughs> the tabs allow it to be mechanized rather than hand collated. So some days I love them. Some days I liked it. Some days they, they were odd. Um, so I'm just going to go right down my list. Um, on enrollment growth, and I guess I, I just want to reaffirm this question. We had talked about the additional funding of 25% of the per pupil cost. Is that does that go into the budget for the year it's projected? So if you're projecting, no. it goes so, in the following year. Right. So what we actually get are the actual numbers from the prior year. So this year we had we added 169. So okay. it's going to drive next year's number. FY16's number is based on FY15's enrollment. And so in the long-range plan right. to go the multiple years, in the out years when we no longer have actual numbers, they become the projection numbers. So you get 100% of the, not promised number, you get 100% of the promised number just a year later. A year later, correct. Got it, okay. So with, 
the following, hold on just a moment, I've got my, um, so this year's enrollment, right? So we did have some, we had one projection, like I said, it came in much, much higher. So what is the plan for going forward on those? So if you do have larger class size and you get the money, are you gonna try to true it up in the out year? This is my one question as a parent, I promise. I will, I'll skip to the finance questions No, I mean, after we, this. we wanna maintain, we, you know, we wanna maintain reasonable class sizes. We wanna, when we add a section, when we add a class, it's not just a class, a teacher, a piece of chalk. We don't even have chalk anymore. Um, but it is all the ancillaries. It's art, it's music, it's, it's phys ed, it's all those other pieces. So adding one student means that we're adding more than one. One classroom doesn't equal one teacher. It has a, it has a ripple effect. And it's not always such a clear relationship. You know, one of the things that we've implemented is the buffer zones. And Dr. Bodie spends an awful lot of time trying to balance class sizes using the buffer zones. You know, or you know, if we look like we kind of have a half a class here and a half a class here, try to make sure that we put one class in one place and not tiny class, tiny class. You know, okay. Trying to keep them all balanced. Right, That's but if you do with, with have a situation where you're like at kindergarten classes, larger than you would have targeted in, in a certain school, whether it was this year or the upcoming year. Um, is there a plan to sort of try to even it out in the other years? Because I would, I would guess, well, not guess, I would have heard, you know, the large parental concern is, you know, you say, okay, you're stuck, you have your kid in this large kindergarten class, but if it, you, what your, your biggest concern is it sticks like that through mm -hmm. their whole way through the or system. Or it gets bigger as kids move into it. Oh, the right, yeah. right. That's, I mean, what is the, the thought there of trying to confront that? Well, Kathleen, well, <laughs> <laughs> that's the uh, uh, well, it's a it's a it's a great question because it's a very challenging one. It's uh, what the challenge is is that if you were to break it apart, it, or if you were to break it apart so that they would have smaller classes, and we did that um, in in one school, and the classes went below twenty. Well, that was great, but on the other hand, that's an, it's expensive when you look at the whole. And um, But I do think to the extent that when um, a particularly large class goes through a school, if we can have some years uh, where there would be smaller, that would be the ideal. But one of the things that we're gonna be pushing against increasingly is that we may not have the space to do that. Um, in putting other, another additional classroom in. But the, uh, that decision about, uh, actually that came up for the one, oh, particular school this last year, it's like balancing, should, should we have a class size that's so much lower than the average of all the other grade level? And there, therein becomes the dilemma of trying to balance equity. So I, I, it's, it's, I can't give you, a, we're always gonna do this because it's very situational to the particular class. We, we look, very closely at the data in terms of how the students are performing. And in fact, we've had much more of a focus on that in the last year, in the last few years. We have teachers that work in data teams really looking at the progress of every student. So it's not a hard and fast, but um, I know I've had a principal talk to me about doing exactly that, and just making get a year to get the kids having smaller, a smaller group. But right now, our app, we went through this, to make sure we did it, um, <coughs> Jennifer and did it together. We, the average class size in the elementary is um, about 22.8. So it's between 22 and 23, which is good. It's just that we do have some outlier classes that are 28. And that's a problem. And so when we have class sizes like that, which we did this year in, in one school, of the fourth and the fifth grade, we have put what we call large classroom TA, a large class TA in there so that uh, it's possible for another adult to be helping the teacher address the, the needs of a larger group. Okay, um, so on the FY16 special ed mm -hmm. budget, um, so every year I think the big concern is that we, you know, we have the school budget, we set the appropriation, and then we have a budget busting event in special mm -hmm. ed. And I think we came into this year, um, well, I at least thought when we sat here last year pretty nervous in the fact that mm -hmm. we had we draw the reserve down to zero, but yet, you know, so there wasn't a lot of room. I also was a little nervous. Yeah. Um, so now we have, we're gonna have somewhat of a, hopefully a cushion in the two to $300,000 range 
in, in the account, but the growth of special ed is not going to be up at that 7% level, which, um, what would we do if we did have a, a budget busting event, if we did have something that came through that took out the two, 300,000 and then a little more after the year started? Well, that's why, that's a good argument for building up the reserve. So th that, that's been a high priority to get that money back when right. I knew we would have to take it out all last year. So you have to look at your, your budget. We also have um, a lab credit that is sitting out there that we could use. But ever since um, the budget of 2010, we don't use that in, in our budget calculations. But I know it's sitting there as a possibility. It's not a lot of money, but it's a little bit to help um, and make sure the credit may, may, may grow as part of that. So um, I think by having, at least sitting where we are right now, knowing we're going to have some money in the stabilization account, knowing there's a lab credit, I, I think that if we had an, uh, a residential placement, and that's all it would take to wipe <coughs> that out, um, at least we have some cushion. But you have two students like that, which was our experience not too long ago, it's very challenging um, to make it up in the in the rest of the budget because it's to the, the I think the sense of what I, I certainly Mr. Foster was getting at is that we don't want a situation where we are taking away from general ed too because we already are having challenges there in terms of class sizes and um, so the long and short of your answer is there's going to be pockets of money to pull from we're looking at next year maybe having a not at the rate of the 7% growth Hopefully that remains the, the case so that we can put more money in the stabilization account. That would be our ideal. But should it happen next year, we would have to look very uh, carefully at revolving accounts and um, also our budget and see what we could trim mid-year. Okay. On the facilities department, I'm going to agree that you consent to it. That was always one of our questions because obviously the manager presented it. but. Um, you know, you, you, part of your people, but you have spoken to it, so I'm going to assume that's correct. Um, it is. Good. Uh, so the only question I do have on that is, when, when you were talking about the maintenance department, you kept talking about a new facilities director and administrative support. That was the first time we've, I, I sat right here, just so you know, because I'll be very transparent, and went over additional personnel with the town manager, and he said we'll have a new facilities director at the end. And then you kept saying and administrative support. Isn't isn't it in the um, the? It's on the chart? side little bubble. It's but when I asked chart. him about new positions, he never talked about new administrative transfer. positions. It's it's transfer. Is it a transfer? Or is it a new position? Well, we're funding it as a new position. I know you are. That's why. Because you said well, half of it, ninety thousand. I did the math on that. <laughs> it's basically uh, for purchase orders and all of the. It's it's a secretarial position. It's not. That's what that well, I just wanted to know that you're right. so your understanding is that there's a new facilities director and a new administrative position. Whether that, that would be a transfer, I don't know, but we want to make sure the success of this department, um, besides the leadership and the additional administrator that will come with this, you you need to you need to be able to have somebody who's going to be able to do that kind of a role. Now, whether there is a movement within departments, I can't I couldn't tell you that. But in terms of thinking it through, in terms of how it needs to be organized, we need to have somebody who can do the billing and follow up on all of that. That's, that's going to be absolutely essential. Okay. And then as a, as a comment, I'm sure you've, you've, you've thought about this, is you were talking about in FY17, moving your building um, expenditure, or at least the budget that you're building over to the facilities department. But next year, you're going to have an odd situation where you're going to have a facilities department, but you'll still have to retain budgetary authority over it, so you'll have to have some kind of stopgap. Well, it's business as usual. I mean, we've, we've had that budget for a long, as long as I've been here. Because the people aren't going Correct. in next year. Correct. Well, oh. we're adding we're adding the, the director position, we're adding the admin position, or, and we're paying for half of it on the school side. But everybody else is in our budget as it's always been. And I think when, we, when we're ready to move the budget to the maintenance department, we're going to be looking at their expenditures over several years and saying, you know, here's, what, here's their run rate year over year because they have good years and bad years, as, as we all know from the snow this year. Um, you know, so to do something fair and equitable so they have the best chance for success in the long run, we want to give them a fair budget. 
Okay. And then last two quick questions. The first one's really out of date probably at this point, but I'm going to ask it until someone throws me off the finance committee. Um, relationship with the town manager's office? Good. Everything working? Well, I heard they shoveled your roofs. <laughs> they did. They did. We, we're we're uh, hoping we can give them a little bit of money. We don't have to go through all our snow and ice uh, budget. No, we have a we have a terrific working relationship. And and to to this issue of the of the facilities uh, department, we met many times about this in terms of how we could work it out. Um, we we have regular and uh, frequent communication on a whole variety of issues. Well, well good. And I think I've said this every year. I think that my biggest pet peeve will always be it's a probably a long gone issue, but I think I'll ask every year because I think it is important that you guys both have a relationship <coughs> and that, you know, as since the town manager does come to us three, four times a year that you are, you know, on an equal footing as him. And then my last question is what well, keeps you up at night? I ask that every year too. It's a broken you record. Stole that question. Depends on the week. <laughs> I think I think um, this the, this particular week there was just a, a lot of things that are just in the in the plans and just thinking about the details that go with it to make sure you covered all of the details. You know we're we're moving forward with Alice training and having that in place. We have the SOI that's going out to the school committee thinking about did we did we mention that strong enough I mean you wake up thinking about these kinds of things so uh, it really depends on what, what is really in front of us uh, last year uh, as at this time I was concerned about what was what we were going to face this year in special education to be honest because I, I as, as uh, Ms. Johnson and I was very concerned about totally draining that but we didn't have really much choice on, on it but um, the goal was to see if we could build that back up again I um, think one of the worst things for all of us more so for the people that have to do it are the state unfunded state and federal unfunded mandates that uh, they come down uh, mm -hmm. without realizing what has to do an example is the ELL thing I think I heard from to me it's retrograde education pulling kids out of classrooms past 20 years we're putting kids into the classrooms and making it work not realizing or not caring the financial impact of these things mm -hmm. and as a former educator I think the worst thing in the world to drive education is money uh, it should be the kids first and these unfunded mandates just when you think you get your head above water they throw another one we thought we had the budget together nine seed cut cut the, uh, the, the funding for the kindergarten uh, grant and uh, the ELL thing Threw it in a rake, then these poor people have to turn around and find a way to balance it again. And I mean, it's how they do it. I don't know. Okay, uh, Jane, you finished? I'm all set, yes, thank you. Brian? Um, this growth in um, students, is this Arlington? Is it Arlington, Lexington, Belmont, or is it a statewide thing? What is it? So is, um, it, it is not statewide. When you get past the 128 belt, um, you're seeing decreasing enrollments. What you're seeing inside, and maybe along the perimeter of it, it uh, is increasing enrollments. Um, I think the community that might be growing the most in the state is Brookline, but you know, Chelsea, Arlington, Lexington, Winchester, Belmont, um, Newton, everybody's growing. And I, and it's, I think, the proximity to Boston. Uh, we have uh, the, the ge next generation of, of young people who really do like urban life and want sort of that balance between the two and don't want a, a, a long commute. A lot so of the, there's a whole lot of reasons why I think it's happening. So as we go forward, are you expecting the growth in all the grades or just, are you, as, you, as you're going up to like 600 in the, um, uh, in the births, um, do you, really expect I get let me step back you said that there was growth in all the grades not just in kindergarten mm -hmm. so would you expect this really to balloon out of control I mean I'm based really, upon what you're seeing I'm really ex I mean my my projections for what they were so I mean it is a crystal ball yeah I, obviously you know they, they show alarming things um, I'm really excited mm -hmm. about having an alternative methodology to approach this and come up with something else and hopefully come up with something that won't keep me up at night. But, um, you know, all of that, and I, it's, 
it, we're all guessing. You know, I, I think Arlington is an extremely desirable community. <coughs> the community is great. Um, you know, I think people are increasingly willing to trade the three-car garage for not sitting in the car for an hour and a half every night. You know, I think we may be seeing an overall demographic trend that people are just shifting in to the inner suburbs. Um, also, I don't know if you remember last year, I went ballistic. <laughs> As I start reading the budget book, and I and I started going through it, God, you're moving away, <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, I just re I, there, I was beside myself. There was I found seven hundred fifty thousand dollars worth of expenses that just had no um, prior year expenses, and during for, in the budget book there was no current year expenses expected. Well, in looking at the new book, there was a column that's been filled in that wasn't filled in last year. So I want to say thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I am pleased. Um, and. Uh, I'm going through this, I, I'm a CPA, and going through this, I've been through all sorts of budgets and everything. I've never seen anything just, it's amorphous. It's moved, uh, the way you've moved it and all these different things. I'm like, what am I looking at? I do not understand it, but it's the same bottom line all the way across. I just want to compliment you that you do a really good job with that. Thank you. Um, speaking that. of which, another thing I don't understand, <laughs> um, not trying to beat sped to death, but um, page 27, you have listed the town expenditures. Um, so this is the town, this is the part of the town appropriation that's being spent on spent. I understand. Where's the other three million? I'm looking at just fiscal year 15. Where's the other three million come from? Because the budget is nine, is close to 19 million. Oh, um, circuit breaker. Okay. And grants. Okay. So we get about a million dollars in the special ed grant from the Fed, Fed through state, mm -hmm. and Circuit Breaker is we're up to what one nine. Mm -hmm. Is that is that in the funding? On the it, funding? It is. If you if you look on the previous slide of the funding, oh. just flip it over to the other side. Um, you can see in eleven when the green is really fat, that was that was the ARA funding years when we had extra federal money and we were using it predominantly on SPED, and that allowed us to, to save up our circuit breaker money so that now we spend the circuit breaker the year after we receive it. So um, in 11 and 12, circuit breaker is half <coughs> of what it would have otherwise been. Um, going to the budget book, if you go to section three, is mm -hmm. that just, which line item is that in there? That's all it was, I, again, I'm just going back and forth, and sure. I didn't have this chart when I was looking at it. Sure, um, so special ed, um, the special ed grant is SPED 94-142. That is the, the massive grant that we get. It's about two-thirds of the way down under grants, under academic support yep. above teaching American history. I'm sorry. I'm SPED 94-142. There's no account numbers on this. Grants. It's, a, okay. it's in here. It's in the funding, the funding description. The oh, funding? There. Under grants. Okay, I'm sorry. I was looking too low. Thank you. <laughs> So that's the big one in special ed grants, but there's also a special ed early childhood that's up a couple of rows from that. And there is a special <coughs> ed program improvement one that's down near the bottom of grants. Okay, that's, you understand why I'm confused now? <laughs> Sorry. No, it's okay. You know, this-, this Some, Somebody is reading this book. <laughs> I'm glad to Just, hear that. Um, it's not the funding sometimes. summary is basically in the order it is because that's the way I inherited it. Uh, and, and that's is, fine. I, I don't the I'm not questioning that the order. Change. That's yeah. per, it's perfectly fine. But circuit breaker, if you look at circuit breaker just while we're here, it's the first line under revolving fees and reimbursements. Mm -hmm. You can see that that it's really climbed up over the years. Um, the 1961 that we're proposing to spend in 16 is what we're collecting this year. And that's based on a 72% reimbursement rate. Um, so our out-of-district tuition, our expenses are growing, and so we get more circuit breakers, yeah. we spend more. If, they, if Governor Baker and his folks decide to lower that percentage significantly, that could really hurt us in 17. Because but, you know th those, that special ed expenditure has really gone up and up. Okay. I mean, well, it's good overall. It's good support. Yeah. But um, you, know, it, it, you get dependent, and then <coughs> okay. But uh, in a good thing that it comes a year late. So we get the money in one year and we spend it in the next, so yeah. we don't have to guess. So there's a little bit of savings there. Yeah. Um, one last question on that. What's foreign visas? Oh, okay. 
We, um, we have students who come from overseas <coughs> to come to Arlington High to experience an American high school to perfect their English. And in order to do so, their parents pay a tuition fee. A tuition, that's tuition, okay. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm not sure how it got that name, but that name preceded me. That, um, just a little odd. <laughs> it is very odd, but. We work with a company called Educatius, and virtually all the students come through that program. And, and they're required by federal law to, to pay tuition. We grant the, the visa. You finished? Yep. Okay. Uh, Stephen. Thank you, Alan. Um, yeah, I have a, a few questions. First, starting on the, the, the cost center summary um, in f section five. Um, for this year, on facilities, and I have a, a follow up on facilities as well, the projected expenses, it looks like it's about $840,000 less than what was being budgeted. And then took a look in the detail and it looked like natural gas was budgeted for 996,000 and your um, project expenses are a lot less. What, what happened with that? What, because that the Stratton, the envelope of the, of the wing, um, the new roof, the windows, the containment, um, and, the increase, and the increased efficiency boiler, the unit vents, and it went from steam to hydronic. So the Stratton's saving us a bunch of money in gas and the, the Thompson, is now fully online and has gone through a year. And I was I was holding on. I didn't want to reduce budgets there until I saw what the Thompson really cost me through a whole cycle of seasons. It, but but was there something that you were expecting in, in fiscal 15? Because the actuals for 12 through 14 were about a half million dollars each year. It was the Thompson money that I was kind of hoarding on while Thompson was offline, I, not knowing what it would be like when it came back online. Okay. Um, and then on facilities, we had the presentation last week, and one of the things that was discussed is while the labor will be moved into the facilities department, the, if you have an outside service coming in or, mm -hmm. or materials, that's going to stay within your budget, as that far as my understanding. My understanding, understanding. Okay. My understanding was it's all going to them. Okay. Be, well, I think well, that's we'll something that's going to have to be discussed we'll because we'll one of the concerns is if the facilities director <coughs> believes some work needs to be done, and it's let's say at the Audison, for example, and you and it's not just labor, um, salaries and wages. I thought the manager had said that's going to come out of the, um, the individual school. So hopefully, and, and what I was concerned about is if facilities thinks that work needs to be done, school says, no, we don't have the money for it, who wins the argument? My understanding is that the money to fix things will go to the maintenance department, and they will fix things. That they're not going to be billing back. We're going to get away from that whole hateful yeah. gray billing thing. Okay. Well, I hope. Well, that's that. That's a discussion point because that's they. And I brought it up in the context, and I'll, I'll make the pitch for it here, and then go to another question. Just the floors at the Audison and in, in the high school, for example, they they should be resealed every year, and that's that's I, I promise the basketball people. I said I'd say that, and and so in the example I gave, um, they said, well, if it's an outside service, that that cost will remain in the school. So. Please work it out, but please realize that it's, it's, it's something that, uh, that, that, that should be done. Um, the other area I had a, a couple of questions on were, were on funding summaries, and that's back in section three. Um, on the revolving fees and reimbursements, and, and I've had this question for several years, we received the budgeted numbers for 12 through 14 and a budgeted number for 15. But we never have actuals, and, and I know in years past um, we've had back and forth on it. But I, I really think we should know what's actually <coughs> being collected, and if, if it's not something that's being accounted for within the school department, then maybe we can get it from Ruth Lewis or, or something. But for ticket sales, and, and I know it's a small number, but when you add these all up, mm -hmm. it would be nice to know what we're receiving every year. You're not the first person on this committee to ask me this question tonight. Okay. <laughs> So um, it's fine. And, and just so you know, we report to the school committee every month about where our revenues stand. So you can go back to our website under budget, yeah. and there's tabs for each fiscal year. And if you go to the June report, you can see the revenues we've collected as of June. It's not a full picture of the fiscal year, but that's available all the time. Right. So each month we, te we, we tell the school committee where we stand in terms of our revenues coming in. Yeah, no, and I think that's great. And I went there for March. And other than the Bishop bus being $2,200 over what you're projecting, <coughs> everything else seemed to be coming in 
on budget, and, and, and that's great for your monthly reporting, but I, I can't imagine every year Did ticket sales hit 45, no, I didn't go back in time. Well, your most current report is, is, is the March one, but. But you can go back to prior fiscal years and look at the June reports. Yeah, and see what you have. Yeah. Yeah, because I, would it be possible to get that added to this budget report in future years, what, what the actuals are? Because I just think revenue is, that, that's part of the picture that we need to, to, to look at. And, and it's, we get it in expenses, and if there isn't a way for you, for you to get it, we should help you either working with other departments that are recording the receipts so that we know, because I think it's, it's, we're missing part of the picture here. So do you think that's something that we can do in the future? Certainly. Okay, all right, because I, I, think, I, I think it's, um, it, it, it will help us understand where things are and, and uh, how we're doing, because I know what you're spending against grants and I know what you're, you're spending against the revolving fees. Um, a further question on the rentals, on the, on the building rentals, um, and again, this goes to cooperation between town and, and school. If, if the recreation department is using the Audison of the high school, um, do they pay the same rental as if I, I went in with a, is it say I had my own group and I wanted to go in on a weekend and rent the Audison, is there a different rate? We have a tiered rental system mm -hmm. based on whether you're a for-profit venture, a non-profit venture, or a school-based venture. Okay. And, and that's how it's tiered. And so depending on you going in there, if you're making money off your kids, we'll charge you one thing. If you're a nonprofit, just cobbling it together to do things for the kids, that's another thing. And if you are, you know, a coach, uh, you know, the Audison's hired you to do something, then that's a different situation. Okay, and, and if the recreation department is using it, that's the lowest, is that the lowest rate? Is, is there a rate that for the right? I just um, generally, no. Okay. All right. The reason, I, and I think that's great. I think that's good. My concern is within your budget and, and up the street at the rink, if Arlington High is using the rink, they pay the same hourly rate as any other, any other group. And it seems like if we're doing it here, there should be a discussion um, because you've got people paying fees for, to, to play on the hockey teams and um, it really shouldn't be the same. And, and so I don't know if there's been a dialogue about that, but it, it, it grosses up your expense because when you go to the hockey programs, your, your fees or your services, which is ice time, it is in, inflated and it should be you know, some sort of cost figure or, or um, some sort of reduced number built to reduce the burden on the um, players, reduce your budget um, and recognize it's, you know, if we're in this era of cooperation between town and schools and, and we're going one way with, with the buildings, it should go that way with the rink and maybe that creates opportunities to provide more ice time to the public school as well. Well, ice time is a, certainly an issue. You're yeah. probably aware of that. Um, as far as the fees go, I, I know that when there is this there's this fiscal relationship between the rink and the responsibilities of the town on this, and there's a, the rec department is an enterprise system. Yeah. So there are costs associated with that they're trying to cover, and I think that all of the fees represent their desire to be able to stay in the black in terms of the, the running of that facility. Um, but we do talk. Uh, um, Mr. Connolly is in communication on a regular basis with our AD, <coughs> and um, I certainly have talked to him a, a number of times. There's one thing I, I will say is there's a lot of cooperation among all the departments in the town. Um, this has been true for a number of years. We meet on a monthly basis, and there's an ease of communication. Um, and so there, there's no friction, let's put it that way. There's just no friction about this. We're always trying to, if there's, if there's an issue, we're trying to figure out how we can problem solve it to have it work out. Okay, that's great. Just one last comment on that one. Just on, on the cost centers, we got into the discussion earlier with uh, Charlie had on special ed, and, and special ed has its own cost center, mm -hmm. but it's also included in other cost centers. Is there a way to maybe better define what that special ed cost center is? Because it's, it's not all inclusive. Really. Right. The, um, the special ed cost center is kind of the, if you think about the central admin thing. Yeah. So psychologists could either be charged off to each of the schools, they do half time in each building, so you could put half your salary to one school and half the other, 
before you could consolidate all their salaries under the code 45. Yeah. If you want to see this Fed expenses, the program is the way to see them. That gets them all consolidated. But what this does is, if you didn't include special ed expenses in the elementary school cost centers, you'd have a really skewed look at what it costs to run your school. You know, we, we've got yeah. to have, you know, the special ed interventionists, the teaching assistants, the speech therapists, the, o, you know, the OTPT. We need these things at every school, the, the social workers. And if we budgeted them all centrally in SPED, I mean, it would give you a quick and easy place to see SPED costs, but it wouldn't really give you a sense of the school. Yeah. It also wouldn't give you a sense of the community. And, and when we're budgeting, we're trying to think about, you know, the cost center as a community. So the, the special ed cost center is upper level admin, um, people that really float, like the, the BCBAs, the behavioral specialists who, who consult all over the district, and people who do that kind of stuff out of district tuition. Um, things like that sit in 45. Um, a regular special ed teacher would sit in the school to which they're assigned. The SLC programs, um, which are 85, 86, and 87 for cost centers, reside actually each of them in three different buildings. Uh, but the expenses for that special um, concentrated learning program are kept together because you know a child who needs those services is likely to progress through the whole program. So, you know, you can slice and dice this way dozens of ways, and the struggle is always to find a way that makes the most sense but does allow you to see things from different vantage points. It, and it does make for a confusing document. But on the other hand, I mean, you can, you can look at the cost centers and see the cost pretty fairly of a school. It also, the cost centers capture any repairs we've done to that building, but we budget the expense under, seven, uh, under the, the facilities. You know, I don't run around and throw plumbing expense in each of the buildings. But when I have a plumbing expense, I book it to the building where they did the repairs. Right. So I can see over time the actual expenditures where they happen. So you can have a sense of, you know, what's the run rate of repairs on this building? The MSBA is really into that. They want to see how much you're spending on maintenance on a given building. But trying to budget that way would drive me to madness. Right. No, no, and I, I think it's fine to put it in the buildings. I just think it, it maybe the, it there's it a little bit more of a descriptor on 45. So that someone doesn't look at it thinking that's an all-inclusive right. type situation. Right. So that's all I have. Thank you. Steve, did John, did you have a question? Yes, I did. I'm sorry? Yes, I did. May I? Yeah. Uh, <coughs> I'm going to drag you back to special education. Oh, hold on. So, uh, it, it's clear that the two largest expenses, of course, are general education and special education. And it would seem to me you have a reasonable handle on projecting what the big uncertainty in the area of mm -hmm. special education. So my impression up until this meeting, having heard the manager talk about how he had helped to increase your budget in order to handle the increased population, was that that was going to sort of handle the increased population but, and in addition then, your stabilization <coughs> fund was going to help to handle the great uncertainty that you always have with special education. So when, when I look down this column here on, on this page, okay? Oh, that one's sort of where Charlie was earlier, okay? Uh, when you go from 12 to 13, FY 12 to 13 on the special education, there was a quarter of a 3% right there, okay? Then maybe the, the big jump was 13 to 14 with the 12%. And now you have kind of a projection of about a 3% or so in, into uh, this year. And I'm guessing that's a fairly solid number. Yeah. You're probably going to... Spring, once it warms up, uh, out-of-district tuitions can really take off. Kids can go out of district very quickly when the weather gets warm. So, so, so that in itself is, is uncertain. Correct. Yeah. So you Correct. could go up to four or so percent. We yeah. absolutely could. Can I, can I make a worse. comment on in that? Between, in, in between semester, trimesters. Yeah. Right. Right. The, the, but it's allocated in the FY chair. Oh, sorry. It's, it's allocated in the FY15 line. Okay. Mm -hmm. So somehow between now and July, what you're telling me is that there's even uncertainty in that short period of time. That's correct. Okay. 
All right, and, that, and then your projection for 16 is an order of 1%. Well, it doesn't include the normal contract increases. All the contract increases are consolidated under admin. That's why it looks so mutated, because we haven't settled the contracts yet. We don't know how much we're going to give the teachers. We don't know how much they're, they're going to go. And so rather than basically throw out misleading numbers, which could interfere with negotiations, we've consolidated what we think we can afford all under admin as a pool to be settled as we settle the contracts. And once that happens, we will show everybody's contract increases. We will show the changes in the appropriate budgets, and you'll have a very different picture of what's going on. Okay. Is it, can, can I have a comment? On the, just maybe a, when we're at this point in the year and we're budgeting special ed and projections, all we can do is take where we are now as a base, our audit district, the number of staff we have, all of that, and say, okay, if we were to roll this forward next year, what would be the increases? And the increases would be contractual. In some cases, it's, it's what we know about tuition increases. We've gotten letters from these different schools. It's not going to be a big projection. We don't know really what the actual spike is until we're living the year. If you look, I think, at any of our budgets in the past, I, I would say this with a little bit of confidence in the last couple of years, that the, the projections aren't going to be you, great. I you get that? Okay. <coughs> I understand the uncertainty, but your nominal estimated number is an order of 7%. You said that three or four times now. Okay. That, that is our revenue number. We get 7% in revenue increase on a portion of our town appropriation. <coughs> that helps to defray the cost of special ed growth, which we've seen grow on average 7% over time. Maybe I must have understood you, but I thought you had said that you'd gone back and looked over, you know, the last five or seven years or something like that, and the average increase year by year by year uh, averaged Not over the entire period was order of 7%. That is correct. Is that mm -hmm. correct? That is correct. So I would have expected to see a 7% jump here from... 15 to 16 as your nominal number. And that's what's that's what bedeviled me in, in all this conversation here. Why why isn't why is it don't I see something like seven percent, which is a nominal number, for that jump between six, 15 and 16? Well, we're really hoping, based on the best information we have now, that we're not going to see seven percent growth in sixteen. But your nominal number is seven percent, so why did you put that in the budget? I see that's what well, I don't understand. Wouldn't about. you want me to be as honest as possible about what I truly expect to see? Well, it's it's sort of hard if you're trying to budget from where your base is. And the whole purpose of, the, of your uh, stabilization fund is to try to handle that uncertainty. That's true. But right now, there's zero in the stabilization. I would have thought that would I mean, I think that the Long Range Planning Committee, when putting all this thing together, usually gets a 10 year look back on the, the special education. And uh, that, goes in, that goes into their bottom line appropriation, just like the 3.5% for general and just like the 25% for, uh, uh, for, for growth. And how that money gets allocated is up to the is get up to the school committee. If they don't think they're going to need to go up 7%, they can go up higher in their, uh, uh, in their general education. It, there's no use allowing a large pot of cash to be sitting there when they don't think they're going to use it at that point. Now, with the last couple of years hasn't gone up 7%, gradually when you look back 10, that 7% number might start coming down. Uh, it's it just, you know, it goes like that. I think it was your... I think it was last year they had to transfer a large amount of money from their stabilization fund because of that. But um, I don't want to answer for you, but it, it would seem silly to put, pick a number, $500,000 into the special edge account, which they don't think they're going to spend when they need all these other services. Okay, well, maybe, maybe it's just the, this graph that's, that's confusing, hmm. so maybe that's <laughs> well, and it is particularly confusing because of the non-settlement of the contracts. But, but one more statement I, that I think I should make is that you have to worry about re replenishing your stabilization fund now. Yes, yeah. we do. Mm -hmm. and, and, and how is that going to happen? In other words, do you, do you think that 
you're going to put money in from this year, which has been a, a, a good year. In order right. to put we're how, much, how much would you hope to have? We're hoping to put between two and three hundred thousand dollars in this year. If you look at this slide, this slide here. Okay, is there anybody else who has not asked a, uh, a question yet? Uh, Ken and then Paul and yeah. Alan. In the last year during the, um, during the budget, the, we got into the uh, Metco program and there was talk that perhaps it was costing the town hundreds of thousands of dollars to support the Metco program. So my question right now is that what do you expect the income to be for this fiscal year for the Metco program and what do you expect your expenses to be? Well, if, if the budget holds as Governor Baker has projected, we will stay level funded from this year. And I think our total number was what, three, about 350, what was that? Uh, 15 was originally 388.095. So whatever monies we have this year will be available to us next year for the program. In addition to that, um, all, the, all the students um, count for Chapter 70, so that money comes into the general coffers. So as far as you're concerned, the program is paying for itself? Well, it depends on which way you analyze it. Mr. Foskett and I have a very different view of it. If you, if you look at it in terms of your per pupil cost, and it, we're saying that, say roughly speaking, 13000 is our per pupil cost for each student, should that be the amount of money that we receive for uh, a student if you combine the allocation, grant allocation, and Chapter 70. But we looked at even just our enrollment growth factor and the, the number that we came up with for an additional student, because there are some costs that aren't going to change whether we have um, an additional <coughs> student or five students or ten students was 25 percent of per pupil. If we're looking at 25% of per pupil, then I would say that we are, are definitely within that range of income with a Metco student, yes. It really depends on how you, you want to analyze it. The, the monies we get from the grant pays for any of the personnel associated with the program, um, the bus monitors, and transportation. Uh, so all of the expenses relative to the administration of the program come out of that. Clearly, the town supports the students in terms of the cost of being educated in the classroom. Thank you. Okay, Paul? Um, so going back again to this slide on page 27, where you said that, that 290000 is um, what you hope to move into the stabilization fund, can I then conclude that that $1.5 is what you hope to put in the stabilization fund next year? Would that it were so. Um, a big portion of that would be the contract settlement so the teachers get their increases. I thought the contract settlement was all in the administration. The salaries are sitting here in the expenses, and as they moved from 15 to 16, they got no increase. The cost, the cost of the increase is sitting in administration, but the actual expenses of special education are showing artificially flat going into 16 because there's no normal step up for another year of contract increases. So I'm hoping there will be a savings in 16, but it will not be that large. Um, I, I mean, I still don't understand. I thought all the money for raises is in the administration. It is, but what you're looking at here are special education expenses. And if you look at the special education expenses, the green bar in 15 and in 16, they're practically identical. And we know that if we had exactly the same number of staff from one year to the next, and we gave them typical increases, it would not be flat. It would go up by whatever the contract, let's call it 3%. And that, that increase is absent right now because the money isn't here where it will be spent. It's sitting in admin waiting for a settlement. It would be transferred in when they actually settle, the settle everything. The green, okay, line, but the green line will but, go up, but, but the red line will stay the same. But won't that then be added to the town appropriation for special ed. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the number will go down. The differential will go down. No, no. What I'm saying is the appropriation. The, will the, green, the, appropriation the green will line is the expense for, for FY for the last column. Mm -hmm. That will go up by the contract. The contract. Settlement. 
And won't the red line also go up by that company? No, the red line is the red line. That's okay. the appropriation from the town. Okay. That's static. All right, thanks. Okay, Al? Sorry for dragging this on, but in all this talk about the special education and the, and the stabilization fund, I, I hope I don't insult anyone, I can't stop thinking about snow and ice. <laughs> we had a, 100 inches of snow, and the town manager came in and asked for a million, a million point two, um, because there's a lot of snow on the ground. It wasn't predicted, wasn't budgeted for. If two special ed, if two students moved into town with very expensive needs, and the stabilization fund wasn't sufficient, going back to Dean's question, at what point do you come to the finance committee and say, "There's money, is there money available from the reserve fund to deal with this?" For this year. Not this year. I'm, I'm yeah, speculating year. the way Dean was. And you know, I'm trying to get the right balance between stabilization fund, dealing with the uncertainty, and the fact, and there's, there's a sort of sequestered <laughs> stabilization fund, but then there's an overall emergency funds available through the town. That's a fair question. I, I mean, I think I would do all within my humanly powers to not come to you guys for money. But obviously there's a, there's a limit, you know, 10 kids fall out of the sky, you all need residential treatment and I'm gonna come with my hat in my hand. I mean, it's sort of, it sort of impacts. If, you know, to really handle an emergency, you need a million dollars in the stabilization fund. Mm -hmm. But then that million dollars is sitting there, sort of doing nothing or, or being appropriated to other, you know, for other reasons, the way maybe Charlie was implying. Uh, whereas you, you sort of hope that Two students won't come to town, expensive students won't come to town, and we get 100 inches of snow at the same time. There's an overall averaging of expenses. And I'm trying to figure out what's the right balance between sequestered stabilization funds versus overall stabilization funds. I'd like to see that, I, I know the stabilization fund for special education was set up to have a limit of $800,000. I'd like to see that be higher. I think at least a million would be a safer margin for special ed because we've seen a million dollars swing in any given year. Um, and I hope that we can build it up to that point. I can't speak to the snow. That's, that's, out, that's out of my pay grade, I'm sorry. And you can't speak for when there's gonna be a few students coming in with very expensive well, needs. You know, it's, <coughs> we, do, we do do projections from the students we have within. Who's at risk for going out of district? Who, who, has a potential, who has a potentially volatile and or expensive situation that could blow up at any time? We're keeping an eye on that. The joker is the kids that move from Utah or some other place that we have no way of knowing are coming. You know, if we have them, we kind of have a picture. But if they just drop out of the sky. A, a colleague of mine out in um, Pittsfield had exactly that. She had three drop out of the sky and she had to go to her, her city council and explain that she had three drop out of the sky. Um, it happens, it happens. It's, it's the thing that keeps all school business managers awake at night. I guess yeah. I'd, I'd like to see in, within long range planning or something in that context, thinking about either you know, snow falls out of the sky or students fall out of the sky. And they're probably well, we, hopefully not going to happen at this point. Yeah, well, we did have it happen, and I think that uh, that's something that we have a strong memory of. Yeah. Um, and to that, to that point, our motivation for having that stabilization account be as high as it can is strong. In addition to that, we, we also have some revolving accounts. It's certainly uh, a, a, pos a position that we did not have at that particular time. So it's never one thing, it's a combination in terms of how you, you manage uh, these uncertainties and the very expensive uncertainties. Now, my, in line with that, my understanding is that if a student transfers mid-year from another town within Massachusetts, that they have to cover the rest of that year. Do you aggressively go after those? You betcha. Oh, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not the in-state transfers that kill us. It's the ones that come from out of state. Now, you also, I assume, keep track of those that age out. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, anybody else who has not answered, asked a question yet? David? I really don't have a question. I just want to say thank you for your presentation. And Mr. Chairman, could you in introduce your colleagues over here, Thank please? you. Uh, Ms. Starks, who chairs our budget uh, subcommittee, Mr. Pierce, and Dr. Susan O'Connor. Thank you. Okay, okay uh, Peter. <coughs> I, I look for AYCC uh, in your budget. I don't see it anywhere, but I see plenty of uh, 
under cost center 36, it's not specifically identified, but the money, the money to pay the AYCC contract is under health and wellness. Health and wellness? Health and wellness. I'm sorry, I'm losing my voice. It's cost center number 36. Okay, you said here? Yes, thank you. Okay, anybody else who hasn't answer, asked a question yet? Okay, anybody, any other questions? Any other question? No. <laughs> <laughs> a, a question back on the, on the cost center summary on between the projected and the budgeted for fiscal 15. Looks like presently there's a, a deficit of over roughly 400,000. Mm -hmm. um, how, first of all, is that still what it is? And second of all, how is that? going to be either closed or, or how, are you, how are you going to address that? At this point in the year, I am not yet picking up savings that I'm pretty sure I'm going to have. We get the last of our purchase orders in um, pretty soon, right before the April vacation. And once we book all of those final <coughs> expenditures from all of the departments and the schools, um, we get those all on the books and then we usually have savings there. We also have things that we haven't spent so far like settlements and legal and all of that, and so we can pick up savings there. But at this point, I don't want to be premature and say, oh yeah, we got savings here and here. I do think we're gonna have some savings. I think we're gonna close <coughs> that gap significantly, but I'm not ready to commit to it yet until we reach those milestones. Also, it's been a very cold winter and utility billing falls many months behind what it ought to. I don't understand that, how they can't build a school and they bill me on plenty on time at home, but it's a chronic problem. So, you know, given those things, I want to be conservative in my projections. But even should these, these projections hold, which I do not believe they will, we do have sufficient balances in, re, in, reserve, in revolving accounts to cover that. Should it end that way? I do not expect it to end that way. Okay. Thank you. Okay, are there any other questions? Okay, Charlie? Yes, I'd just like to go back to my earlier comment about uh, the 7% versus the 35 And I, uh, my clear recollection of separate tracks. In the, on this chart, <coughs> 27, that 1.5 million, is, as we discussed a few months ago, after your settlement is going to go down to somewhere approaching a million. That money should be going into the uh, reserve uh, stabilization fund for, for um, special education. And instead, I, what I discern here is that money is being spent somewhere else somewhere else in general education. And and I think that um, you're putting yourself at a lot of risk. This could making this this budget not conservative for as close to conservative. And I would not be surprised if you do have your unforeseen event and uh, you can't cover it. But it's a comment, not a question. I apologize <laughs> for that. But okay, are there any other any other questions? John. <laughs> I, I, I just want to reinforce what Alan Jones said, okay, which is it's much better, in my opinion, okay, for it to be there to be a large, which is our stabilization fund, in order to handle contingencies because you get snow, you get you know, special education, all kinds of other things, plumbing someplace, etc., as opposed to a large amount of money sitting in your single stabilization fund here. I mean, I, a reasonable size stabilization fund sort of for you seems appropriate. But I, I happen to think a million is probably too big there. That in those instances when you go above five or six hundred thousand, you're going to be coming here to us because that's the right place for the money to be. Not to be stashed in a large number like a million bucks in your budget here and not and not being used, in my opinion. So I'm reinforcing, if you like, what Alan was saying. And I think we've been saying this to you guys for a long time now. The stabilization fund, uh, the reserve fund that the reserve fund finance committee has is for contingencies. Use it, because you shouldn't be, you shouldn't have large money, large amounts of money sitting in a fund in your budget when the best place for that money Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Uh, we really appreciate all, all your efforts. 
maybe I, I, we weren't clear. The stabilization account we're referring to is the one that's under town meeting control. So you have to vote the money into it and vote it back out. Um, so what we're hoping is town meeting will vote <coughs> what the number is in, and they had to vote the 500 out. Uh, I would ra I'd like to see a strong stabilization account myself. That is something that's very important to us. Um, and I also, another comment is that the, the number that we, we had with respect to the 7% coming out of the analysis of a, of a decade was something that we all agreed at. Now, we, we can be shifting what that decade looks like as we go forward and seeing if that, how that number shifts. I think that that's a very reasonable thing to do. But to look at special ed within the range of two to three years is, is not a, uh, a good perspective on really what the uncertainty is in that area. Okay. Um, Doing the DPW budget, I noticed there's a large amount of money paid out by DPW to shovel school groups. Are you aware of that? Yeah. Well, this year we needed it very much, yes. Are we, are we going to put it back in the DPW budget? Has the school going to be a bridge, though? Well, we, we've had some grade billing. I don't, I don't think we had them all. We have, I think Not we paid, the we've just paid the overtime. For the roof, at one point we had 70 people over the February break shoveling, of which some of those people were in our budget, some were in DPW, and some were hired contractors. Um, how that broke out in terms of personnel, but we pay for the, the overtime but for school personnel. I could be imagining this, but I thought the number was close to $100,000 yeah, he paid out. It's a projection. It, it could it's, be. It's, I, it's I don't know what that number was. Looking was he was looking to get back from the school department when we took it out of the budget. Well, I, I think that's on subject to sort of negotiations between the town manager and the mm -hmm. superintendent. Uh, but there is there is something coming back. We do have a line for snow and ice, and we don't I don't know where we stand quite on that right now. Of whether we'd be able to contribute some money back. Yeah. And if we if we still have, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, <coughs> if we want to if we want to meet our obligation to re rebuilding the state the special ed stabilization account, if we want to meet our obligation to the snow and ice, if we want to end, you know, poverty, alleviate, they're all competing factors. No, I think there's been discussions on that, on that issue. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I'm the only one who has, hasn't asked questions. Okay, so um, I understand under three that next year, Diane, there'll be uh, actuals for the prior fiscal year, yes. just for that page? Yes. Okay, and uh, I had a couple of questions on individual ones because I did go to the website that you checked on, but it, it's, it's a little late for that. <coughs> Needless to say, you'll feel comfortable with what you're uh, taking out of the revolving fund fees for a building rental and all that? I do, but I was feeling a lot better about the funding in general before the governor started to cut the kindergarten rent. Okay. So if that stands, we're going to have to do some shifting over the summer to compensate for that. Okay. And uh, it, it sounds like uh, you're confident, Doctor, that uh, you'll end the fiscal year in a surplus situation, not a deficit. We will, not be, we will not be coming to finance committee for reserve fund transfer. Okay. That's good. And as far as the enrollment concerned, I could give you the same uh, advice I gave one of your predecessors. The job is to build the finest school system in the Commonwealth <coughs> and keep it a secret. <laughs> you want to have all these that. people moving in. Uh, Dr. Bodhi and all the rest of you, thank you very much for coming. We really appreciate your time and, and all the effort that went into the, uh, into the budget. Thank you very much. Okay, I think uh, it's a little late to start a new subject for this. So uh, Thursday or Wednesday is going to be a very, I think, a full time. So please be here at 7.30. Uh, you've got a couple of budgets left to present. Uh, if you can be ready with that and meeting adjourned.